Hey friends, this is Kevin Smith. And this is Dr. Evelyn Bethune. We'd like to welcome you to Perspectives. This is a show that is what we call boutique talk, and we want to give you an opportunity to share your opinions on the arts, literature, music, and current events. We take a look and sometimes a deep dive into the issues of the day. So our show is tailored to give you a broad opinion and, as Evelyn said, a deep dive into different multifaceted things as such as culture. So one, one thing we're going to be talking about today, Evelyn, I think you told me. <clears throat> um, <laughs> she, she, hey, before anything, guys, she's the boss. I, I just work here. So, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, this, this is my partner. And um, I, I've known this wonderful lady for more than 20 years, and she is a, she's a very big brain. And so I know I, I come to her for a lot of things. So today our topic is going to be Juneteenth. Yes, um, you know, we talk about Juneteenth, and I know when I first heard about Juneteenth, and, and let me just say this, this is our first show, this is our launch, so we're a little bit nervous, um, and we're excited. I'm excited because it's an opportunity for us to uh, both share information and, and get information to have conversation and dialogue uh, about topics that sometimes need to be talked about, but we don't talk about it. And so um, here we go. Uh, when we talk about Juneteenth, I remember the first time I ever heard about Juneteenth uh, was when I moved to Houston, Texas. And in uh, Houston, it's a really big deal. They have major celebrations. Uh, and then Galveston, because Galveston was the center of the beginnings of Juneteenth. Um, and so I was like, well, what in the world is Juneteenth? And when they explained to me that it was about slaves having not been told that they were free for almost two years two after years. the Emancipation Proclamation um, and had been uh, continued to be pressed into uh, enslavement for that long period of time, I understood the celebration. Right. And I also was just really pissed because how do how do you do that? But then my brain said, well, how do you enslave people for over 400 years? There so you there, you <laughs> there you go. And so uh, in talking about Juneteenth, there are so many other aspects that have flowed from that when we look so at many. today's culture. So many, so many. Uh, um, and it's it's. <clears throat> For me, I think sometimes it's um, those other things that stemmed from um, from Juneteenth are something yes. of a blight upon Juneteenth. Absolutely. Take, take for instance, you know, um, Juneteenth uh, inspired uh, those of that time to institute what they called Black Codes and or, or, or Jim Crow. Um, and so in, in, in talking about Juneteenth, you you can't necessarily go without talking about that as well, because June, Juneteenth, Juneteenth being a celebration, they promptly sought out to end that celebration with these codes. Um, so much like Evelyn, uh, I, I, I hadn't grown up hearing about Juneteenth. That, that wasn't something people talked about. Um, so it was interesting for me to hear about it and learn about it and um, understand what it was and um, and its its derivation um, because it's it is it is a significant celebration but again like I said it's it's kind of um, overshadowed with the other things that came after it. No to, doubt. Right. So. You know, when we, um, I know for me, I'm an avid reader, um, love 
our history and considered myself to be pretty astute in, in things related to uh, African and African-American history. And to never have heard of uh, Black Wall Street, um, Rosewood, and, and, and I will say I learned about Rosewood uh, while I was attending graduate school in Gainesville, Florida, at the University of Florida. And the lady that I lived with um, as a graduate student was a survivor of wow. Rosewood. Wow. And I was there during the time when Florida was deciding whether to pay the survivors reparations. And so people were coming to interview her. And she was in probably her 80s at that point in time. And, and I just felt in my heart that the state of Florida was hoping to not have to deal with this issue until all the survivors were dead. Right. Because they had this had been something that had been before the legislation legislature for years, for decades. Yeah. And they finally were dealing with it. Um, I had so many questions because I grew up in Florida, had never heard of Rosewood. It right. was not a part, of course, of the history that was right. being taught as Florida history. And very little black history was a part of that flow anyway. True. Um, and so here I am, you know, at this point and stage in my life where I am learning so much about things that have occurred in this country to delay our progress, to stop our progress. Mm -hmm. um, during Reconstruction, when we were fresh out of enslavement, uh, we accomplished so much during that time period, electing officials, sending people to Congress, uh, yeah. growing our communities. And here we are in 2021, still having to deal with being stopped people making attempts to, you know, keep us from voting, all kinds right. of things. And so when we talk about these issues, our young people think that, you know, this is something fresh and new. It's not fresh and new. It is these not are issues that have been on the table for much too long. And, and so when I hear somebody say, well, things take time. Well, how much time? Wow. Yeah, exactly. How much time? Because as as far as Rosewood is concerned, that happened in 1923. Yes. And um, uh, when 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 were, did the people come to interview your friend? Uh, uh, this was 1992. 1992. So so just think. Just <laughs> 70 think from, years. From 1923 to 1992, and 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 not not even having possibly heard. The, and I'm pretty sure there are still people in Florida who don't know of Rosewood. I Absolutely. recently I recently learned of some Atlanta massacres yes. in 1906, and um, it's it's staggering the amount of massacres that have gone on throughout the country. I could I could go down a list. There there are some in Chicago and uh, the ones in Tulsa, as, as we were speaking of New yes. York, D Detroit, uh, uh, Florida, Charleston, Memphis, um, and th there's so much. It's it's like a um, it, I, I hate to say it, it's, it's it's a plethora of uh, yes, and, and it, it it spans almost across the country, um, and it it is a uh, uh, a saddening and also a maddening thing to learn because no you have to wonder this isn't something of course that they teach in history books this, this isn't part of history class you know so this this is something you learn outside of school because of course they don't want this history known well you know there is uh, legislation on the books mm -hmm. as, of, as we speak uh, that is being implemented to limit the ability to teach uh, students about these kinds of happenings right. because, uh, as the legislator said, they don't want to scare students. Really? <laughs> I just, you know, his well, you, dialogue on it was just so yeah, bizarre. They, they, they don't want to use education to scare students. We'll, 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 we'll let the police do that. Right? Exactly. We'll put our <laughs> knee on your neck right. um, and video it. 
uh, in broad daylight and you can watch a man call for his mother as he dies. You know, those are the kinds of things that our young people are dealing with. And it's frightening to them. Um, it's frightening to to those of us who are grown and, and you know, adults um, to see how people that we elect can justify insurrection like they're trying to justify what happened at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. Um, These are the kinds of things that make you understand just how precarious our stance is right now as it relates to democracy. Right. And, and what that means to various people, because I am fully aware that democracy means different things to different people, to different people at different times. Absolutely. And depending on their position of power, mm-hmm. what they're willing to do to make sure that it simply relates to them and not to others. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be ever vigilant and conscious. So what we hope to do with perspectives is have that dialogue, share that information, um, talk about the things that matter to various cultures, because not only were there massacres uh, that relate to African Americans and uh, newly enslaved people in this country, but also to Native Americans, the indigenous people, Mm -hmm. uh, trail of teachers. Is real and and the internment of the Japanese who mm-hmm. were born in this country, um, there were internment camps in this country, where the Japanese were relocated, and, and, and so, even the Chinese. Yes, we have to be ever mindful of what has occurred in our history, so that we don't think this is something unique and different. Right or new. So, Right. So that we understand that there has been an ongoing process of treating people who are perceived as being different in this country. We talk about uh, Hitler and the Nazis and what he did to uh, Jewish people. But there is the same kind of mindset when you're talking about what is occurring as it relates to people of color. Mm -hmm. And so we can't get it twisted or think that this was something yesterday uh, and that it can't happen again. Right. It can happen right now today. Right now today. Now, um, another thing that we like to do on perspectives, as we said, uh, not just to give you different ways to think about things or uh, we also want to give you information uh, in, in, in the form of education. So um, I'm going to go over a couple of notes that I've taken. Uh, as as she began, she said um, Juneteenth was started uh, to commemorate the um, uh, emancipation of slaves. Now, that was supposed to have been in 1865. But again, as she said, most black people or people of color did not learn about it until, uh, excuse me, uh, let me go back. That was supposed to be in 1863, the emancipation. But we didn't learn about it until two years later in 1865. Now, um, think about that. Think about that. Um, And now we also have to take into account this is before cell phones. You know, this is before (laughs) media. You know, so uh, uh, things, information took a little while to travel. Um, So in 1863, Abraham Lincoln passed the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, that that declared that more than three million slaves living in the Confederate states uh, uh, be free. And so. Try to put yourself in the shoes of the enslaved people of that time. You are an enslaved person who doesn't know that you are a free person now. So uh, you, of course, are still acting as though. You are an enslaved person. Uh, You are still being treated as though you are an enslaved person. And even though you are a free person, you are, in a sense, uh, shackled still. 
Um, and in many cases, physically still shackled. Right. And, and, and it, it wasn't until Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas, as she stated, on June 19th, 1865, uh, to let people know that slavery had been abolished. So uh, this country has a rich history in keeping things quiet. Um, there are so many things that we could discuss, but we're, we're going to keep our conversations geared toward June 19th and the celebration of that. Uh, and we're, we're going to try not to get too dark because this, this is sometimes a, a rabbit hole that you can go down because there are so many things connected to it. You, um, uh, Jim Crow laws are connected to this. You know, uh, uh, indentured servitude is connected to June 19th because once they instituted the Emancipation Proclamation, legislation began immediately to uh, reverse it and to eradicate it. Um, like limiting to, our vote. Exactly. Now, that's 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 a big thing. Um, they they wanted to limit the votes. Uh, and, and now in in doing that, um, you know, they would um, take away voting rights and control where we lived and how we traveled and even use that stuff to seize children for labor purposes. Now, think about that just just for a minute. Um, you're walking along, you have your son or your daughter, you're, you're a black person and you're walking along and somebody comes and say, we need that child. And you say, what? We need that child. And as a black person, there's nothing you could do. It's it's it's. You're a freed person or in your mind, you believe you're a freed person because you've been told you're a freed person. But there is nothing you could do still even then to stop someone from coming and just uh, absconding with your child. Um, and the, the, the ramifications of that are mind boggling to me. I, um, and, and like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a dark hole. Sometimes you have to keep from going down because it's, it's saddening and, and maddening, uh, the things that come out of something that's supposed to be good. Emancipation was supposed to be good. Uh, emancipation was supposed to move us forward, um, and uh, that, well, with that, we're also going to be talking about uh, things such as, uh, like she said, Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there was a thing called Black Wall Street, where um, we as a people actually had our own community. Let's take a look at what Black Wall Street looked like. Black Wall Street. I think we have a video. By now, you've that we probably can... already heard of it and have an idea of what okay. Black Wall Street was in America at the turn of the 19th century. HBO even made a fictional superhero series about it. Can't hear it or see it. aren't aware, here's a quick history lesson. After slaves were freed in 1863, black Americans quickly proved to be faster learners than their slave masters thought they would be, even after intentionally being deprived of formally educating themselves for the previous 200 years. By 1920, one place in particular was widely known as the Mecca for black excellence. Think Atlanta, Georgia today. That place was Tulsa, Oklahoma. There were black millionaires across the country like Mary Ellen Pleasant and Madam C.J. Walker. But Tulsa essentially became the birthplace of African-American entrepreneurship. Thank you. Black Wall Street is in many ways a misnomer. Because what, what 
the business community in the Greenwood District, the black community in Tulsa, was like, what was, was more like, would be a black Main Street. Since these were mostly small businesses. So there were movie theaters and dance halls and barber shops and grocery stores and restaurants and service providers like doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and dentists, um, hotels, all manner of businesses that you might find on an American Main Street concentrated in a segregated black enclave in Tulsa. Black Wall Street, the Greenwood District, was also a community of necessity. There wouldn't have been a need for a separate black economic um, island in Tulsa had it not been for Jim Crow segregation. So they created their own economy in part uh, across the Fisco tracks, separated from downtown by those, by those tracks. Eventually, things quickly changed. By this time, the KKK was also quickly gaining prominence, particularly in the South, and of course, were not happy. After two days, the mecca of black entrepreneurship became the center of destruction. But most, unfortunately, did not see it that way. The community was rebuilt after that to a substantial degree peaking in the 1940s, early to mid 1940s, with well over 200 documented black owned and operated businesses. But then there was a second devastation. This was not a devastation uh, affected through violence, but rather through policy. Black people lost their fortunes and even family members and were never able to recover. Last summer, Forbes estimated that the Stratford Hotel alone owned by O.W. Gurley was worth about $75,000 at the time, which would be $2.5 million today. And that's just one building. Imagine how much money that was lost. This month, there will probably be plenty of media outlets re-educating us about the events that happened in Tulsa. But we gotta take things one step further because the new Black Wall Street is here and it's here to stay. Across the country, black women have become the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. In Tulsa today, the rebuilding has also begun. But the new Black Wall Street is no longer concentrated in one location. It's spread out across America. Forbes The Culture is taking a real look at businesses and entrepreneurs that make up this new era of Black Wall Street and defining what it is and what it means to be a part of an unprecedented number of black movers and shakers in nearly every city in America. It's amazing, amazing. what a made up mind can do yes. when given the opportunity. And, and so when, when people talk about uh, we don't like to work. We don't, all we want to do is sit on the porch and wait for a check. Um, there's a reason that we are in that position because it is something that has been systematically institutionalized in this country to take away all that black people in particular have worked for and, and not to put any other culture you know, on, on the grid or forget about them. There is no story like the African-American story. Correct. No other culture was brought into this country um, on ships in shackles. And, and so when we talk about our history, it's not to demean or forget about anybody else's, but it's to make sure, like the Jewish culture, that we don't forget about how we got to the place where we are today. True. And and our our people came out of slavery and took nothing and made some incredible strides. Incredible. Right. There was no 40 acres and a mule. And there was nobody to pull us up by our bootstraps because we didn't have boots. <laughs> and and so, wow. you know, when we talk about these things, we talk about the position of the African-Americans, uh, our, our people, where we are today and, and how much further down the 
uh, wealth pole we are. Right. But that was a planned strategy. And so that's how you can't cure something without getting to the root cause. That's it. That's it. Now, let's let's talk about the root cause. I'm glad you said that. Uh, that's 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 a great segue. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. And again, we say root cause the the massacre. I'm going to read something for you guys. Just, so, get, so bear with me. The massacre began during the Memorial Day weekend after a 19 year old young man named by the name of Dick Rowland, a black shoe shiner was accused of assaulting a young Caucasian female by the name of Sarah Page. Now, um, she was 17, uh, she was a 17 year old white elevator near, uh, nearby uh, where the location was called the Drexel building. Um, Mr. Rowland was taken into custody and after the arrest, rumors spread through the city that Rowland was to be lynched. Now, very soon after that, um, they went and got Mr. Rowland, and the the massacre ensued. Um, I can't remember how long it endured, but uh, once it was done, a cover up began. It was um, over a two day period. Over a two day period. Two day and, period. And and um, if if I recollect correct, was was that uh, the instance where they would set fire to a building, and once a person ran out they were shot they shot yes uh they also burned a lot of people alive in those buildings they also dropped incendiary bombs from airplanes mm -hmm. uh, from a nearby airfield um and so they were attacked both from the air and on the ground Landing men and women and children shot and killed uh in many cases yes and 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 given that you know that it was a coordinated attack no doubt so so just think about that for a minute. Let, let that let that sizzle in your spirit as a as a, uh, an Atlanta comedian says. Um, you have a coordinated attack upon a region, a, an entire region um, based upon a. Uh, uh, accusation. Based upon an accusation. Right. We haven't gone to court yet. Right. And exactly. we're going to drag you out and hang you in the street. Right. There, there, there is no due process. No due process. They, they made a, 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 um, a judgment call and they acted on that judgment call and it lasted for two days where they, they, they destroyed homes, businesses, families, individuals, um, lifestyle, culture. Um, and, and not only did they destroy but there was such a jealousy of this community that they took possessions that belonged to these black people, like grand pianos, um, the liquor from the liquor stores, um, the and, and we're talking about high end kinds of, of things, the furniture. Right. Okay. They didn't just destroy it. They stole it and right. took it home to their house. And then, um, and then once they once they were done with that, they, they even seized. The property. The land. Yes. Yes. They, they seized the property and the, the newspapers aided in. The Absolutely. Absolutely. So, again, th think about and that. And then they me. dug a mass grave. To dump the bodies in. And that was discovered uh, through a lot of research and and many of those places. And they did it. They placed them in a graveyard. They did it in the, the, the darkness of night. Uh, threw them into big boxes right. and buried the boxes at in places in the graveyard. Um, and, and some people witnessed this and were so fearful for their life that they never talked about it. Right. That they never <laughs> talked about it. Now, and, 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 and just uh, again, we, one thing we like to do on perspectives is to give you a different outlook um, and um, possibly expand your mind, your thinking, um, because even with the celebration of Juneteenth, you cannot celebrate Juneteenth without remembering, uh, and you shouldn't do it without knowing, um, 
uh, things that preceded it and things that came after. Yes. Um, so, again, well, one thing we like to do is uh, institute not just information, but education um, and also enlightenment. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed to have a, a, a good friend in, in, in Dr. Bethune uh, because these things weren't talked about in, in my home as a child. So these things I didn't learn until I was an adult uh, and, and who already had children. So I didn't learn until I had myself had children and was an adult. So and what these things, they open your eyes to um, uh, just how dark um, the birth of America is and just how fantastic of a people we are. Because again, like she said, we took nothing and made it into something so so widely revered that they had to take it from us. So if there's anything that can be said about the African American race is that we have a resilience and a level of persistence and a um, a heightening of uh, how to, when to, why for, and what Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Yes. That it 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 cannot be denied and it cannot be disparaged. So, uh, if there is someone that you know who is uh, down and out about this, that, or the third. It only takes learning about things of this nature to to uh, because for, for me, it, it sat me down. It sat me down. I, I can't necessarily be mad about my situation when my situation is far better than the situation of enslaved people, when my situation is far better than the situation of those in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, who were coordinated attacked so it it, it 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 lights a fire I, I think it lights a fire and no and and it, it, it makes you think and it makes you celebrate it makes you celebrate uh, and Juneteenth should be a celebration it should sure. it, it, it is also called Freedom Day in in some areas <laughs> in some regions so uh, yes. and it, it it is our emancipation because we had to take our freedom because even though our, our freedom has never been given to us well now you know the recording on my phone my voicemail say says what i was gonna say that freedom yeah. is not, it's not free. free absolutely there is <laughs> a not price free. that has to be paid mm -hmm. and in our case the price has been paid ten thousand times a or more. Mm -hmm. and and so uh, we hope that you will join us on our program um, on a regular basis, uh, we will be live on the air every second and fourth Wednesday. We look forward to sharing our experiences and listening to yours. Yes. We want to hear your voices as well. But we want you to share this information. Talk to people. Tell them to join us. Perspectives with Kevin and Evelyn. And, and we are just delighted to be able to come to you on this new platform. Uh, there is much information available to you about our history. Um, I have a book called Bethune, Out of Darkness into the Light of Freedom, and it's available on Amazon. And it talks about the life of Mary McLeod Bethune, who's my grandmother, and what it was like growing up as her grandchildren. But there are so many other books that we hope to share with you. Uh, we hope to have guests and uh, share the music, the arts, all of those things. Mm -hmm. and, and as a final thought, we, we'd also like you to use perspectives to um, educate yourself because yes. our history isn't a wide known history. So take, take the time to learn your history, not just your individual history, but the history of your in, your people in this country um, because we as a people 
are ignorant. And I always say ignorance is not bliss. I do not believe it to be bliss. You know, they, they there's a saying that ignorance is bliss, but I do not believe that to be so. It's actually so, dangerous. It is dangerous. So um, we would like people to use our show to enlighten themselves, to educate themselves, and to learn about themselves, yes. whomever that may be. We're not just going to talk about the African-American experience. We're going to talk about much more than that. But we begin there. Because that's who we are. That's who we are. Absolutely. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kevin Smith. And I am Dr. Evelyn Bethune. And, and this is Perspectives. Is perspectives.